On this Tuesday night, hospitals on alert for the more contagious and more dangerous variants. More people are going to suffer and die from the illness. Fresh warnings of a compounding crisis. Updated guidelines on who should get vaccinated next, who's being bumped up in the queue, plus the new delivery delay. Critics take aim at Ottawa's new offer to buy back banned weapons. I feel betrayed. The bill triggering many questions. And from a snow NATO to treacherous conditions. Slow down, slow down, slow down. The bone chilling blast of winter leaving Texans powerless. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with the slow burn of variants across this country. The number of new cases of COVID-19 is dropping right now, but there is growing evidence highly contagious new variants are picking up steam. There are now more than 570 confirmed cases of variants of concern across all 10 provinces. The true number is likely higher since genomic sequencing is needed to confirm the cases. Most involve the variant first detected in the UK, but the South African and Brazilian variants are also here. These variants have been smoldering in the background and gaining fuel that now threatens to flare up into a new rapidly spreading blaze. Public health experts warn not to become complacent and that it is too risky to begin easing public health restrictions now. Yet some provinces are doing just that. Ontario lifted its stay-at-home order for much of the province today and reopened schools in the hardest-hit regions. Alberta and Manitoba have also eased some restrictions, allowing gyms and restaurants to reopen with limited capacity. Saskatchewan today extended its public health measures for at least four more weeks. All the virus needs to spread is for people to come into contact with each other. We know the variants of concern are much more contagious. And now there is some evidence from the UK the variant first identified there has an increased risk of hospitalization and death. Heather Urich's West has our top story tonight. Students in Toronto trudged through the snow to get to their first in-person classes of 2021. Schools reopened in Toronto, Peel and York this week after an extended closure in order to control the spread of COVID-19. But with variants of concern in the community, some on the front lines fear the reopening is coming too soon. In Ontario, what we're doing is simultaneous school reopening and economic reopening while these variants grab a foothold in our community. And to me, to do those things at the same time doesn't make any sense. The variant that first emerged in the UK has been detected in all 10 provinces, with evidence of community spread in four. The rapid rise of cases in a previously well-controlled situation in Newfoundland and Labrador is a testament to how quickly things can change where more contagious variants are introduced. That province has now linked nearly 300 cases with the B117 variant. Its ability to spread more easily from person to person remains a concern, but now there is also growing evidence to suggest this variant could be more dangerous as well. A document posted by British government scientists Friday examines a series of recent studies on the variant that first emerged in the UK. Based on these analyses, it reads it is likely that infection with variant of concern B117 is associated with an increased risk of hospitalization and death compared to infection with non-VOC viruses. And that risk would be somewhere around 1.3 for every three people that get hospitalized or die with the usual type of COVID-19, then four are going to be hospitalized or die um, with the new variant. Recent modelling in Ontario and Alberta has shown that without new restrictions, the B117 variant could become a dominant strain in just weeks, leaving hospitals to brace for an impact that could be more severe than anything Canada has seen before. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. The variants of concern are more transmissible, less responsive to vaccines, and make reinfection more common. Here is how they evolved. The first genetic sequence of the novel coronavirus came from a sample taken from a worker in the seafood market in Wuhan, China. That seed has grown, branching out into a family tree. The more people the virus infects, the more it replicates. Over time, genetic changes occur, creating new branches known as variants. Most variants are of little concern, but three, possibly more, have emerged with advantages, allowing them to thrive and outrun others. 
First detected in the UK, South Africa, and Brazil, what makes them extraordinary are the number of mutations they've acquired at once. These three possess the N501Y mutation. It affects the all-important spike protein, the key that opens the way into healthy human cells, making these variants, it's believed, up to 50% more contagious. Canada's top doctor says the public health agency is still examining what impact the variants might have on vaccines. Canada's sluggish vaccine rollout is supposed to pick up speed this week, though today there was another setback, bad weather. Here's Mike Lacatura. Next week, we're expecting an even larger shipment from Pfizer again. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is doubling down on his promise to have 6 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines in Canada by the end of March. That's despite bad weather causing a one-day delay to the Pfizer shipment. Vaccine makers like Moderna promise orders will be filled. He confirmed that, as promised, we are on track to receive 2 million doses of the Moderna vaccine before the end of March. That's in addition to the 3 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine expected in the next seven weeks. Still, just 1.7% of Canadians have gotten a shot, far fewer than many of our allies. On the weekend, the United Kingdom announced that it had vaccinated 15 million people in 60 days. The United States has vaccinated over 54 million people. I'd much rather be in Canada, given the number of deaths and cases in the U.S. and the U.K., over the last year. Dr. Alan Bernstein is part of Canada's COVID-19 vaccine task force. He says Canada is vaccinating at the same rate as countries like the Netherlands. His big worry? The more infectious and more serious variants. Well, the combination of those two things means it's bad news. Uh, And so the sooner we vaccinate people, the sooner we'll have fewer people walking around with virus. That's why the focus will soon be on the provinces and how quickly they can get needles in arms. Will the Prime Minister start showing leadership? NDP leader Jagmeet Singh wants to call in the military to help with the rollout, but the country's top doctor says human resources isn't the issue. We have many pharmacists, family doctors, you know, other, other health professionals, retired. Um, they, they, they're all volunteering. So we've got the volunteers, we just need more vaccines. Pfizer is saying it's possible its Michigan plant could start supplying Canada later this year, likely speeding up the entire process. But a company spokesperson said for now, Canada will continue to get doses from the facility in Belgium. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. Though the majority of Canadians are still waiting to be vaccinated, there are new recommendations about who should be given priority in the second phase. Racialized communities disproportionately affected by COVID-19 are among them. Eric Sorensen explains why and what phase of the rollout you fall into. As vaccines are ramping up, more Canadians will be lining up. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization is prioritizing who, in turn, should be vaccinated. Stage 1, underway now, includes residents and staff of congregant seniors' care homes, those over aged 80, followed by those over 75 and then over 70, frontline health care and personal support workers in contact with COVID patients, and adults in Indigenous communities most at risk. A large percentage from stage one should receive first shots from the six million doses expected to arrive by the end of March. Stage two includes indigenous communities not covered in stage one, residents and staff of other congregate living settings, including group homes, all those aged 60 to 69, first responders, police and firefighters, essential workers who can't work virtually or from home, and adults in racialized and marginalized communities disproportionately affected by COVID-19. That's a new priority group. The approach is based on saving lives first and then protecting people that are working close to uh, folks that are at risk of contracting COVID. A recent summary found racialized people in Toronto accounted for 79% of COVID-19 cases when they only make up about half the actual population. But one expert says the priority should be on jobs that are high exposure, not on race, which could touch off resentment. These uh, essential workers, where a lot of them are racialized, um, the job really puts them at risk. 
And if you have that as a criteria rather than the race, because you can have white people working in fast food restaurants or in grocery stores as well. If, as promised, millions more vaccines arrive this spring, those in stage two could start to be vaccinated in the second quarter. Stage 3 includes adults aged 50 to 59 and those 16 to 59 with underlying medical conditions plus non-frontline health care and essential workers. These are guidelines. Specific priority groups will be determined by the provinces. With COVID numbers coming down and vaccines going up, the outlook is improving. But there remains an X factor. The COVID variants make the course of the pandemic still uncertain. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. The families of people who died in horrific conditions at a Montreal long-term care home will have to wait several more months for a public inquiry. The coroner leading proceedings into COVID-related deaths in Quebec's long-term care homes has agreed to delay the hearing of the Heron residents until September. 47 people died there last spring. Testimony was set to begin yesterday. The care home's owners asked for a delay until prosecutors decide whether to lay criminal charges. The coroner says the inquiry into other Quebec facilities will proceed next month. Nine months after it was promised, the federal government has laid out new gun control legislation. It includes a buyback program for banned assault-style weapons and allowing municipalities and cities to ban handguns. But beyond those broad strokes, there is very little detail. As Mercedes Stevenson reports, that includes how much it will all cost. The tableau in Ottawa of the Prime Minister joined by key members of Cabinet sets a scene that underscores the political importance of the gun control message for the Liberal government. But let's not forget what this is about. Saving lives. Following through on a campaign promise, Trudeau announced a new bill with a range of measures. The bill promises a gun buyback program tougher penalties for smuggling or trafficking guns, makes it easier for police to seize them, and will allow cities to ban handguns. The buyback program will be optional, not mandatory. While the guns are illegal, some will still be out there. I feel betrayed. Something gun control advocates say guts the legislation. The only way we could have really changed the picture in Canada would be to have a mandatory buyback, to have something permanent and to have a permanent impact. Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchette won't support the bill due to the optional buyback, which he says makes the the position, the law, under many regards, useless. The government estimates there are between 100 and 200,000 now prohibited firearms in Canada, but officials don't know much about them. We actually had no information and have no information about who owns them and where they're located, or even what makes and models are out there. There was also no official estimate of how much legal gun owners will be compensated or what the program will cost. But Public Safety Minister Bill Blair spitballed three to four million if the government pays an average of $1,300 per gun. The Canadian Sports Shooting Association says that's a vast underestimate. We're looking at Probably in business inventory in Canada, somewhere between three and five billion dollars of inventory in Canada. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole accused the government of targeting the wrong people and questioned how the measures will stop illegal guns like the ones used in the Nova Scotia massacre from entering Canada. Mr. Trudeau misleads people when he tries to suggest that that buying things back from hunters and and other Canadians who are law-abiding is somehow going to solve the problem of of shooting and criminal gang activity. Why the federal government is leaving it to cities to ban handguns when they are the number one firearm used in homicides in this country is unclear. Donna? Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thanks. The mayhem, the mess, and the misery in Texas. Coming up, the snowstorm that slammed into the Lone Star State. In Amsterdam, they are skating on thin ice. This group was pulled from Amsterdam's canals on the weekend after they fell through the ice. It is cold, but not cold enough to solidly freeze the canals. The skaters struggled to get out and were rescued with the help of ropes and hockey sticks. Dutch officials have urged people to avoid risky skating because the hospitals dealing with COVID-19 patients certainly don't need the extra burden. 
People in southern Ontario had to wade through heavy snow this morning after a powerful storm hit. Some school boards in the greater Toronto area had to postpone the return to in-person classes today. Toronto district schools were open, though buses were not running. In Whitby, two children were trapped in snow, pushed by a plow. Police say one was taken to hospital with serious injuries, the other has minor injuries. And much of the U.S. is enduring a brutal blast of winter. From the Great Lakes all the way down to the Gulf Coast, the storm is putting lives at risk. Cities in the South and the Midwest have reached record low temperatures. Texans, though, are bearing the brunt of it. As Jackson Prosco reports, millions of Texans are in the dark. The record-setting cold in Texas might be bearable if people still had heat and power. The thing is, there's no end in sight right now. More than four million customers woke up to a second day without electricity, left to warm up in their cars or by the fire. After the state's electricity grid buckled under demand, fueled by the bitter cold. This morning when I called, they told me 10 a.m., but uh, I called back after 10 a.m., and they said that they were just working on it, so uh, I don't, there was no update. In Fort Worth, residents are under a boil water order after the water treatment plant lost power. The blackout threatened to spoil thousands of doses of COVID-19 vaccine, which needs to be kept ultra cold, leading to a surprise rush to offer them up to the public before they expired. I literally dropped everything, got everything on, and sprinted here. And apparently everyone else had the same thought as me. In Dallas, the temperature dropped to minus 18 degrees overnight. The city rarely sees temperatures below freezing. In Houston, some simply tried to make the most of it. When you live in Houston, you don't really have regular sleds. The unprecedented winter storms spun up a rare snownado and put the entire state of Texas under winter storm warnings. Slow down, slow down. The weather system responsible impacts a wide swath of the U.S. 120 million Americans are left to face everything from snow to freezing rain to bitter cold to deadly tornadoes. At least three people were killed overnight in North Carolina after their homes were flattened by a rare February twister. I've seen devastation that I have not seen in many years. It's truly, truly was a disaster last night. Back in Texas, the winter woes aren't over yet. Another storm is set to move in on Wednesday, this one bringing freezing rain. The millions already in the dark have been warned the power may not come back on for days. Jackson Prosco, Global News. The rise of another virus ahead, the disease making a deadly comeback in West Africa. The value of Bitcoin rose sharply and hit a new high today, a sign major companies could be warming up to cryptocurrencies. At one point, the digital coin surpassed $50,000 U.S. A year ago, the cost of a single unit hovered around $10,000. Bitcoin's value has been on the rise as more mainstream companies like Tesla say they will accept it as a form of payment. Viruses don't care that we're already in a pandemic, and right now another one is making a resurgence in West Africa, Ebola. Guinea has declared an outbreak. And today, the WHO put six neighboring countries on alert. Five people in Guinea have died from the viral illness. The Democratic Republic of Congo has also reported three fatal cases. Although there is no indication the outbreaks are linked, the Ebola virus has ravaged both countries before. The largest Ebola outbreak in history began in Guinea in 2013. More than 11,000 people died in three countries, before the epidemic was declared over in 2016. Pandemic puzzle next. Why is India's COVID case count plummeting? You're watching Global National. Something is going on in India that is perplexing medical experts. Cases of COVID-19 are plummeting and no one is exactly sure why. Vaccinations have been ruled out because they only began in January. Redmond Shannon looks at what's happening. By last September, new COVID-19 cases in India hit 100,000 a day, with fears the spread would only get worse. But as the second wave took off in the West, India saw a steady drop-off in cases for five months and counting. 
I come to think of it, this is one nightmare I'm never going to live down. This New Delhi couple is relieved that as their symptoms subside, so too has the spread. The worst is definitely over and uh, it's just a matter of time before I think total normal life uh, will restart. So has India unlocked some COVID-19 secret? We have actually now entered a much safer zone. However, the danger still lurks around the corner. The transmission has come down, partly because the susceptibles are either already exposed or are better protected. Already exposed sounds a lot like herd immunity. Studies have shown a majority of some city residents have already had the virus, usually without symptoms. When you look at India, you have to look at 100 sub-epidemics, not just one big one. Herd immunity implies uh, some kind of a permanent uh, resistance against the virus, and we don't see evidence of that. The concern is that if most people have had mild infections, they won't be immune, especially against new variants. Any suggestions that, well, India's turned the corner and everything is going to be rosy from this point on is quite naive. All you have to do is to look at uh, the Amazonas area in Brazil. There, it was thought three quarters of people had been infected. But the new variant that emerged in Brazil has again crippled the healthcare system. If India can harness the power of its huge vaccine-making industry before new variants take hold, it might just get ahead of its own second wave. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. And that's Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Just because we can't go to Mardi Gras in New Orleans doesn't mean we can't give you just a little glimpse of what it's like this year. They're calling it Yardy Gras this year. Over 5,000 homes and porches have been turned into what look like parade floats. There's a virtual map and people drive along the route. There are even a few Canadian tributes to Schitt's Creek and Alex Trebek. A pandemic can't stop a party. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.